Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Chint. As you can see, after popular demand and the return of Lieutenant General Shokin Chauhan, who's going to talk to us about what's the future in the Ukraine war. A lot is happening on the ground. Some may say nothing is happening on the ground. We need to de decipher from the dust to create a reality where we can understand how this war is going to go forward and what is the future of Ukraine as a country as an entity and as what it stands today sir thank you so much and welcome to the show thank you adi pleasure being with you again after a period of time and i'm grateful to your to your viewers for having insisted that you get me back i've been away uh, with some personal issues but i'm happy to be back with you i've always loved uh, this conversation with you you always have the ability to bring out uh, very challenging questions and the best in me thank you for calling me thank you sir highly appreciate your your remarks um sir uh, you know let me begin with an overall question can russia lose this war <laughs> are the uh, predictions are difficult but let me let me put it in the in this way that ukraine it seems will not lose and russia is unlikely to win so uh, the issue is like this that uh, too many countries are today supporting ukraine right at the same time russia is too large too big a country too powerful a country for anyone to think that they can defeat russia so these two certainties are that ukraine may not lose the war because we don't know actually see yeah, the, the 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 idea about losing and winning is decided on the fact that what was the russian aim hmm. when they decided to invade uh, ukraine that's the first issue and secondly what is nato's aim in defending ukraine so if you put these two things together the only certainty to my mind is that ukraine will keep getting destroyed it will keep losing infrastructure its people will have a terrible time this winter and slowly there will be a ukraine fatigue which i actually saw when uh, during my recent visit to the united kingdom where uh, in trafalgar square uh, there was a collection for ukraine and there was a little bit of a maybe 20 odd people listening to what russia is doing in ukraine in fact there were 40 people listening to what iran is doing uh, and just 20 people listening to ukraine and in some street corners there would be odd people saying money for ukraine but i didn't see a single person put any money in it so there's a fatigue amongst the common people that look forget about ukraine uh, let's see how our life goes because europe itself is going through a very difficult time and that difficult time is going to create a problem among the population 99% of europe are democratic countries which means that they will depend upon the will of the people so the will of the people uh, gets fatigued and they feel that they're losing what is rightfully theirs to ukraine to arm ukraine then they will bring an end to europe or nato uh, giving the kind of aid that they've given ukraine the second issue is about ukrainian refugees once again during my recent visit to the uk the ukrainian refugees are unfortunately held in absolute contempt that's and if not they are not able to be given jobs adi it would be extremely difficult for them to move out of ukraine so there are two sides to this picture one is can russia win this war it depends on why it went into this war what was its aims it's never has it has never said what its aims were yeah other than calling it a military operation and other than saying it was to liberate the russian speaking people 
in the southern provinces of Donetsk. So, if that's the issue, if that was what Russia's aim is, they'll achieve it. They've achieved it. Further, will it cross the Dnieper River? Will it go further east? I, I don't think so. I don't think they'd ever planned that. But what is a certainty here is that Ukraine will continue to lose infrastructure, continue to lose people, and continue to lose friends. There will be a time when Zelensky will have to sue for peace. And, and well, that's the way it goes. Indeed, sir. I think, uh, you know, as far as uh, Ukraine is concerned, it's a sad state of affairs and it's uh, being used, if I may. And uh, you've kind of hinted onto that by saying that nobody really bo is bothering about what's actually happening on Ukraine. It's a larger perspective of a fight that you're talking about. Ukraine may be a mean to an end. Uh, having said that, so when we look at the Russian situation today, they've got what they need as far as Donbass is concerned. There are certain territories of the Donetsk People's Republic still that needs to be. The Battle of Bakhmut, which is supposed to be the linchpin, is still on. Um, the southern part is pretty much stable. They, they withdrew from Kherson, which was, uh, you know, contested both the sides as a victory. Uh, but having said that, this whole mobilization that the Russians are doing, sir, there was, there's been a big shortage of manpower in Russia right from the beginning of the war. We see the deployment in three regions today. So one is in the north in the white Russia, Belorussia. We see another one close to the Kharkiv region and the southern deployment, which is happening in Kherson, Zaporizhia, sort of a region. Mm. Yeah. What do you see happening with these deployments, sir? Is this going to be an inch forward? Is this going to be a big arrow offensive or a small arrow offensive or what's what's in Russian mind right now that you can read? Uh, from what I've sort of analyzed this war, uh, Adi, Russia will do nothing other than keep destroying Ukrainian infrastructure till the month of April. Yeah. Till General Winter is doing its job, uh, the gen generals of Russia are going to do nothing. Just keep Absolutely firing. Absolutely nothing. Mm. They're going to be basing their strategy on the fatigue of winter. If the Ukrainian public survives a dark winter because they have no food, no oil, no electricity, no heating, then sometime in April, May, when it becomes drier and before the, 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 the months of the mud, you might find a Russian offensive to straighten the line. But they are behind uh, they, they are behind the Dnieper River. They have consolidated on the eastern bank of the Dnieper River and prepared strong defenses there. Mm. Uruk Ukrainians will find it difficult to cross that two kilometer wide river. More so since the retreating Russians have blown up all the bridges. Mm. Ukrainians have declared victory because they have taken over Kherson. Uh, can they launch further in winter? I doubt it. I, I seriously doubt it. So, this is what I feel. They will keep launching missiles, keep launching long-range long artillery, keep destroying the infrastructure of Ukraine, and keep ensuring that there is a fatigue in the minds of Europe and the people, because Europe too is suffering similarly. There is no, uh, you know, my visit to Ireland uh, and, and the UK recently is any indicator. People say, look, we've got to live too. Why isn't Zelensky suing for peace? So who's fighting for Zelensky? <laughs> They're fighting to reduce the military power of Russia. Yeah. But there's another larger issue. Is the issue that at the same time when Russia is losing its military power, China is increasing it. To the West, which is the greater danger. There might be a change in strategy over the next six months. There just might be. The switch to the Pacific. You might be. You never know, sir. 
everyone has to take what is in the national interest and what is the greater danger that's the main thing adi how will they cope if they're fighting russia and china the russia is we know <laughs> what's going to happen there sir but sir the interesting thing which i find is that the russians have been moving forward i would say inching forward in the donbas pretty consistently and they're not they're not big arrow offensives and stuff like that one of the things i take from your answer is big arrow offensives will lead into a lot of casualties absolutely right so they are kind yeah. of just they they fire and move dheere dheere chalte raho what's the rush they're straightening the line they're straightening the line they're improving the defensive posture the waiting for winter to finish europe is so already there's already snow in europe there's already yeah. snow heavy snow so, falls a siberian type winter a lot of the, stomach a lot of the russian analysts say that winter is what general armageddon is waiting for and the offensive or whatever it may be i mean uh, i personally don't think there's going to be big air offensive but whatever they they planning to do is going to be somewhere at why, the end of january why would a russian analyst give the russian strategy this is to keep them guessing and say well we might be coming we might be coming abhi aa raha hu abhi aa rahe but i don't think there's going to be anything till april mm mm-hmm. Last Even time that Putin's yeah. choice of February as the launch of his uh, special operation was foolish because of the the winter mud. That that that's why he got caught up. I don't think they'll make that mistake again. So Ukraine as a country, when we look at it, it's surrounded by nations that actually built Ukraine. You know, um, you got the Russian half, which is the eastern Ukraine, Crimea, of course. um and crimea is an interesting story I'll, i'll ask you a question separately sure. but romania has a claim which is of course moldova and that entire region you got the hungarians who are eyeing a certain region but the most vocal of them are the polish now here is a country i don't understand with an army of about 80 or 100000 men and total of about 250 tanks they want to fight russia and the thought about uh taking over the western part of ukraine has been spoken by certain polish mps um uh, you know they want to kind of take back that lvov region and you know gain that whole i i i wonder if uh, i am right by saying the polish lithuanian commonwealth um how do you see this because this is a different angle to the ukrainian war altogether it isn't adi it isn't it's a part of the problem that is in ukraine are uh, you aware that uh, pre 1938 uh ukraine did not exist yeah the eastern portion was with uh, poland oh. and what was with hungary was with hungary and the balanced portion was with russia so west of the dnieper river was with russia and the east of the dnieper river was with poland once the soviet union became powerful and poland and hungary were a part of the warsaw pact as well as the larger soviet socialist republic union that's the time ukraine in uh, post the world war ukraine ukraine became what it, what it became uh crimea was given by the russians in i think 52 or 62 to brezhnev gave it to to to, to ukraine so i don't think there's an issue here they just mudding the mudding the waters to say i i don't think the us is going to allow uh the polish or the hungarians to you know do what they some some mps are doing saying there some mps are saying a lot of crap everywhere but the more important thing is that i don't think we should bother about it at all so what is important is that uh, what will happen in winter what is important is the people of the of of ukraine are going to continue to suffer and what is important is that russia has to bring this war to a close as soon as possible and the only reason they are holding out is that uh, they're waiting for the effect of winter 
when we look at war itself sir, and you would agree with me war is another arm of politics so this is not just the battle on the ground it's also a larger battle between the so called globalist agenda of the west and against russia and it's turned out to be an economic fight it's turned out to be a influential fight and it's turned out to be a diplomatic fight so it's uh, it's a broader war i mean uh, i a lot of people say that the ukrainian war has been successful in a way that it's not been escalated out of ukraine hmm. i think it's actually escalated out of ukraine to a worldwide affair because the world has got divided if you look at it i mean there's a there's a clear distinction which is coming out how do you look at the western position today and how do you look at the Rus- russian position today as far as economy diplomacy and reach is concerned uh, with uh, around the world sir okay let us just break this down uh how much has russia lost in terms of her economy 4% in terms in terms of her uh, a monetary system very little nothing has the ruble fallen the american expected mm-hmm. to become rubble but the ruble is not rubble it's only increased in uh, in its uh, in its value russia has oil russia has natural gas russia has important elements of natural resources that the rest of europe does not have that in itself makes russia extremely powerful economically that that's i mean when you talk of economics you talk of the ability to influence other people the power of economics is is mm. the power of their uh, ability to influence the policies of other people yeah europe is waiting for russia to come back and say here's the gas because they don't have cheap gas anymore they don't have that adi and uh, the the fuel expenses are very high people in uh, the, the the united kingdom are barely coping in this kind of thing so i would be very very careful if uh, you know if uh, anyone said anything that russia is uh, the economy is gone on a tailspin i i don't think so i think europe is going into a tailspin mm-hmm. because they may be if they are able to survive this winter without uh natural gas or without very expensive heating uh they will be in a very very bad shape the next winter winter will be terrible absolutely okay. so where will this end come thankfully now adi with europe at war it's not a world war <laughs> you know uh, a century ago a century ago if europe was at war then the rest of the world the rest of the colonial world was at war too now with europe at war with america inside uh, the rest of the rest of the world is not involved yeah so that kind of lack of involvement has been proven by the indian policy of saying look it's your war don't involve us we've got to do what we've got to do and our national national interests are not do not allow us to move from one side to the other we will continue to position ourselves and continue to take advantage of the best we can because economically we are a poor country so if that's our thought process which is fine and with india doing what india is doing the rest of the world rest of the developed world or rest of the world that is going to follow india is also looking at the same thing why would we get involved it's your war fight it i don't see any ukrainian uh, refugees coming to india they are overflowing the borders of poland hungary yeah. uh, a lot of them have gone to uh, to the uk spain france and they fed up with them so again the issue is who is it affecting the most the west uh, the ukrainians and europe western europe because their lifestyle uh, has been totally hit so i i feel somewhere that they may be a relook at this right and if there's a relook then how would people uh, you know they they would be a relook at how they're going to react to certain issues 
uh, during this winter definitely so for me the most important thing is an off ramp i mean normally what you would find is that one country would keep a conversation on and keep a stabilized sort of an environment where both sides can talk to this person today that person is rachit ab erdogan which is not trusted by anyone as a matter of fact absolutely uh, absolutely the russians are using him for this thing and he's going to be thrown out like a, you know soil to show paper when this war finishes and he knows that he knows that uh, he's he's kind of taking advantage of whatever he could right now he's got that gas bank thing going and stuff like that but anyways he doesn't have the diplomatic might to get both the parties together probably russia and ukraine okay but not the west and russia together it's not going to happen the kind of recommendation that recommendation of the russian leadership that has happened um i don't see an off ramp anywhere no you're right there's no off ramp now why am i saying this because if you look at the european history and i've been kind of reading about it for the past 3 400 years peace in europe has only been achieved when germany and russia have had good relations absolutely right even in 1941 absolutely. before the war started i mean the german and russian trains were going up and down they were sending machines and these guys were sending timber to germany absolutely yeah just before the war started so they've had balanced relations so do you see I, i my question is germany is the bulwark of europe sir do you see one of these guys breaking ranks from the west and saying enough i am going to talk to russia and i'm going to sort this out for myself i've had enough i think uh, that's a no brainer adi i think uh, very soon over the next 2 to 3 months germany is definitely going to break away germany and maybe france they they're going to do that the uk will not because uk is too firmly in the nato camp but germans are already questioning that and germans have suffered the most uh, economically so that i mean that that, that i i, I have no to... doubt about it that what you're saying is absolutely right uh there's definitely going to be a system where uh, you know, there'll be there'll be a breaking of ranks amongst the nato uh a lot of things can happen we are predicting the future which at most or at best is unpredictable but if you look at common sense and like i said all these countries are uh, democratic countries and if the populations of these democratic countries are going to suffer during this winter and i don't think germany is prepared to spend another winter uh, suffering in this manner that's a very telling uh, very telling uh, statement if i may say so so yeah <laughs> because you know the, the the biggest thing that i see is the deindustrialization of europe and how macron went crying to the us that listen what you're doing is wrong that told me that there is something of a breaking of ranks which is kind of taking place absolutely so apart from that militarily i mean a lot of concepts have been rubbished one of the things was conventional wars are gone cyber attacks are the big thing hybrid warfare is the you know is the big thing this and that but the dominance of a military force as an army artillery infantry armor all that has seen a revival in this war sir. as a general of someone who's commanded a strike corps as well sir how do you see this are the the concept of war or the character of war or the weapons used for war are to- totally different war as you know is an extension of a nation's policy extension policy. of political will to impose your political will on another country you launch one more part of this this is called military force where you use military force instead of all the other uh, forces available to you like sanctions economic sanctions uh, cyber sanctions or whatever be the other stories when all that is not being used and you decide to change the policy of another country or to impose your will on another country you use the instrument of war so if you look at war as an instrument then 
साइबर ड्रोन्स स्पेस आर ऑल वेपन्स टू फाइट और टू यूज दिस इंस्ट्रूमेंट ऑफ वॉर टू चेंज पॉलिसी सो यू हैव टू मेक दिस डिफरेंस आदि कन्वेंशनल वॉर और वॉर इज फॉट और एनी काइंड ऑफ वॉर इज फॉट टू द पर्पज and everything else are just weapons to gain uh, ascendancy in war or get weapons to gain ascendancy in what you call imposing your will on another country true so everybody is using different different weapon systems and cyber war is one of the parts of this war because cyber war carries with it deniability you can launch it any time <laughs> you can take out somebody's website you can take out country's uh, important infrastructure because there's a deniability and you say look i'm not involved i i don't know how it happened or just say nothing but it's an instrument of war it's one of the weapons being used to fight that war so also is the armor so also is the infantry so also is space so also are aircrafts and so also are drones all parts of the weapon system being used to wage the larger perception of what we call war and each has their own place adi if you want to occupy a built up area you can't do that with cyber you can't do that with space yeah you can't do that with armor you have to have troops on the ground for that infantry has to be there if you want to destroy infrastructure then you can use it with missiles you don't need your troops there you can de- destroy important infrastructure but if you're going to move troops inside and occupy that area then you need the infantry so that's how it is are the every issue has another issue if it was just destruction of inf- infrastructure or destruction of a cyber facility or a capability your uh, ukraine has lost long back long back yeah right so that's just an adjunct but they still haven't lost because their people haven't been subjugated and they're not been subjugated because russians haven't been able to get the troops there so when you say that russia cannot win this war it means that the people of ukraine can never be subjugated using the force that russia has used till now further what happens is a different story altogether true but that the, everything is on the will of the people absolutely sir so if the people have not been subjugated the policy has not changed russia cannot win the war yeah even if there is an all out military offensive a big arrow offensive then i i, I nothing mean, because like... you just don't have the troops to occupy ukraine you don't you can take zelensky knock him out there'll be another guy there yeah absolutely absolutely so the will of the people if that doesn't change if till then ukraine ukraine doesn't lose this lose this war and russia doesn't win it my but if, question... if the idea of war was destroying ukraine's essential infrastructure then they've already lost it on the part of the people sir mm-hmm. um one big question of course it's a bit dicey to discuss on an online forum but i'm going to put my neck out and do it is the right sector in ukraine uh in 2019 the us congress had banned uh, weapons deliveries to the azov battalion and we have one of the injured soldiers commanders or whatever volini or something his name is went to the us congress and gave a lecture what does that tell you sir about um propagation of this particular narrative which of course is a leftover of the times of germany in 1939 um and the change of thought process in the west or the hypocrisy of the west in terms of propagating the same guys that two years ago you banned what it tells you are the that national interests are paramount <laughs> that's what it tells you <laughs> so 
if <laughs> if Sorry. if national interests are paramount then who cares who you are supporting as long as you are destroying the russian capability you're okay and the national interest will change the, the same taliban which was propped up by the americans uh later fought the americans so national interests at one point determine who is your enemy and who is your friend so i don't think we should take all this seriously are you trying to tell me in the next 20 years us will be pounding in troops into ukraine to fight the azov battalions <laughs> we don't know we don't know we don't know how it's going to turn out indeed sir. we don't know azov battalion has been destroyed by russia but suddenly russia has become the power to destroy a right wing force right if russia had needed the azov they would have been ready supporting them after all there are number of pa- powerful private army is the russia supporting including the wagner force or the wagner army so the chechens the same chechens whom russia has fought uh, armies of the chechen are being used in inside ukraine to to reduce the morale of the ukrainian people so the ultimate losers will be the ukrainian people and unless the ukrainians re- realize that that look we are the ultimate user, losers in this we have lost and make attempts to change this there is going to be a problem russia is too big and powerful to fail and ukraine is too large to be occupied yeah, so yeah. both ways is yeah. that's what i meant that ukraine will not be able to lose i mean russians cannot win but russian at the same time are too large and powerful to lose so my last question to you sir and this war prominently brought out a war of narratives um this was played out pretty successfully during the invasion of iraq when they wanted to get saddam hussein on a platter the world bought it more or less there were these fringe elements that that protested it but today's narrative is not being bought the understanding of that narrative not being bought i don't think has gone into the people the holders of the narrative because they they are continuing on with that narrative no matter how silly it sounds mm. and uh, today it's come to a point where even i won't say russian haters but non pro russian people have started saying yeah this is ridiculous <laughs> i mean we, we don't believe this nonsense what does that tell you about holding a certain narrative in the context of india sir because india is also blamed a lot of the times for not propagating aggressively a certain narrative so that does that tell you that aggression in a narrative can actually make you lose your path and make you start doing stuff which will feather everything out like the chinese do it well you said the right thing exactly a narrative is narrative adi we haven't been able to build our own narrative as far as india is concerned mm-hmm. uh we seem to care too much about what people say even fringe elements say yeah we don't need to do that we need that's what i'm saying the 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 debate within india should be what should our foreign policy be what should our policy be within and outside india and once that debate is clear in a popularly elected government well that's it the narrative will always be pro or against you it's always be with that the issue is not to play into someone else's hands not to fall prey to a puppeteer everything has to be based on what your national interest says you must do that that's the issue with with the with the creation of a narrative and i don't think we do ourselves any justice by trying to create another fake narrative i i don't think so adi i think our idea should be that once your we debate is settled then you don't need a fake narrative to say what we should be doing stick to the truth we all agree that uh, the current foreign policy has been extremely well 
well decided, extremely well articulated, and extremely well executed. True. And after this, whatever someone says shouldn't be bothered because those narratives change based on the selfish national interests of people. So I, I feel that uh, the Russians have been demonized, yes, entirely. There's a lot of fake narrative about Putin, his illness, the Russian weaknesses, and all those issues which I don't think exist. We are aware of the Russian strength economically. We are aware of their military strength. We are aware of their stockpile of weapon systems. We are aware that they are now fighting the war from a standoff distance and not deploying their troops. We are aware of the uh, difficulties of operating in a Russian winter. We are aware of the populations that are involved and how decidedly they are going to suffer. So that's what we are aware of. Rest, rest are just narratives. So I don't think we should be bothered about that. Either. We've got to continue taking cheap Russian oil, not put pressure on our people, continue being doing what we're doing, building ourselves up. We've got an enemy on the in the north and the east. That enemy has to be dealt with. Our, our narrative should be based on that. Our build-up should be based on that. Our abilities to deal with that enemy in the north and east has to be made greater and not bother about these silly things. Because no longer are we as Europe the center of the world and no longer do we have to get involved in, in a European war, and especially an East European war. You know, sir, I'm going to take that as a big thing. And let me say this, sir. You're the second person who's come onto this platform. And uh, General Shankar also actually mentioned this, that we should not have a fake narrative. Our narrative must be the truth. Yeah. And I haven't prompted you, and you've really said exactly the same thing. So that tells you a line of that, thought process that, that, that you guys are maintaining. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a very uh, admirable thing that you've spoken. Apart from that, sir, the biggest takeover, take, take off I'm going to write is a I'm going to take is about what you just said. Who are the losers of this war? Which and there is no the doubt case. about. The losers yeah. are the Ukrainians. There's just no doubt about it. And they'll continue losing. Yeah. I think that is the telling point and the bottom line. No matter the big arrow offensive actually happens or not, or the Russians keep inching forward, or they keep doing these standoff attacks is something that the general Armageddon, Suruvikin, as he's called, uh, needs to decide. But I think what you said makes a lot of sense. Uh, why should the Russians get into a ground battle which will make them lose a lot more manpower and resources when they can actually do the kind of damage on a standoff issue? And of course, fight the political war on the larger segment which they are winning. So why would they want to kind of, you know, get into a mud game of an offensive? Interesting point, sir. Makes a lot of sense as always. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And I hope to having more interactions with you since you're Thank back you. after your travels. And, uh, you. you know, we as I'm going to announce it on air that we need to discuss Nepal in a little more detail, sir. I personally am a bit worried about that country. And I think uh, Nepal and Myanmar are two issues I would like to take up with you. Uh, pleasure, see. Some movement in that direction, but some more insights will be always helpful. It will be a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank Until you. I enjoyed this uh, show immensely. Thank you for calling me. Thank you, sir. And Jai Hind. Bye. Bye. Jai Hind. Bye.